Okay, this morning we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians. And everybody cheered. Yay! Fantastic. 1 Thessalonians is an amazing book that covers so many topics. We're not going to be able to cover the entire letter today, but we're going to get through as much as we can in 30 minutes. So stick with me, bear with me. We are going to get through this letter. Amen. Well, the author of this letter is the Apostle Paul, and it was written in roughly the year 50 AD, making it one of the earliest, if not the earliest letters that Paul wrote. This letter is written to the church in Thessalonica in Greece. Now Thessalonica was located at the intersection between two major Roman roads. The first Roman road was one leading from Italy eastward. This was called the Ignatia Road and the other was from the Danube to the Aegean. And Thessalonica's location and use as a port made it a prominent city. In that time it was the second most prominent city in Greece. So Paul here is writing to a church in Thessalonica in Greece, a very prominent uh, city, and he's writing to them to encourage them. Now if you want the background behind the letter, I suggest you read Acts chapter 17, because in Acts chapter 17 we see what, what takes place to bring this letter around. Basically, the Apostle Paul is in Thessalonica, he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ there, he's preaching the kingdom of God, and as a result, there's, there's a stirring amongst the people because they believe that he's preaching against the Roman Empire because he's proclaiming in Jesus a new king, a king other than Caesar. And so the people there get really funny with him, they begin to persecute him, and they drive him out of their city. But not before he's had a chance to preach the gospel and to plant a church there. So Paul has had to flee for his life and his missionary team has had to flee for their life. But left behind is this church now in, Thess in Thessalonica known as now the Church of Thessalonians. And they're still undergoing the persecution due to Paul's preaching and teaching. So Paul is having to write this letter to encourage them and strengthen them to remain true to Jesus Christ in the face of the most severe persecution that they were undergoing at that time. Now there are several main themes, around about eight main themes in this letter. The first theme is persevering in times of persecution. The second theme is the wrath of God on unbelievers. The third main theme is living a sanctified life. The fourth main theme is the second coming of Jesus Christ. The fifth main theme is the rapture of the church. The sixth main theme is the tribulation. The seventh main theme is the church conduct, how you're supposed to behave in church. And eighth theme is the coming salvation in Jesus Christ. So that's our introduction to the letter. Let's now delve into the letter of 1 Thessalonians. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me to chapter 1. And we're going to take chapter 1 on in one sitting. Let's go for it. Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us, and of the Lord, in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath everyone say coming wrath, coming wrath. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath that's good amen, amen. while well, the letter opens up with those who are writing the letter and namely the writers of this letter are Paul Silas or Silvanus and Timothy and they greet the church with two things. The first thing they greet the church with is charis. Charis, we translate it as grace. But we understand that to be God's effectual power working in the lives of believers. So they wish or they hope upon this church the charis grace of God to transform them from the inside out, to give them power, to sanctify them and to strengthen them. The second thing they greet them with is peace. And we know that this is a common Jewish blessing. And Paul and his, his team, many of them were Jews. 
and it's a very common Jewish blessing or greeting to say shalom. And shalom means wholeness or well-being of the person. So they greet this church with God's charis, power and grace, and with God's shalom or God's well-being and wholeness. This is what Paul hopes and wishes and prays for this church. They constantly thank God, remembering this church for their three main qualities that they possess. The first quality is their work, their work. And this work, we're told by the Apostle Paul, is produced by their faith. The second thing is labor. It's a slightly different Greek word used here. It's not the same word for work, it's labor. This word labor means struggle. It means toil. It means working so hard to such a degree, they're kind of sweating. That's the kind of emphasis that Paul is talking about here. Not only are they working for the Lord, they are working to such a high, uh, effectual level of such passion and zeal and fervor that they're beginning to sweat as a result of this passionate work and labor for Jesus Christ. And this passion for Jesus is prompted by love, love for the brethren in the church and love for Almighty God himself. And the third thing that Paul praises them for and that they're outstanding is their endurance. They don't give up. Even in the face of severe persecution and testing and trial, they don't give up. They keep on persevering. They keep on enduring through all kinds of opposition. And this is inspired by hope. Paul says to them that they are chosen in Christ And the reason he knows that this specific church is chosen in Jesus Christ is because of what happened when Paul first preached the gospel to them. Paul said, when I preached the gospel to you, it didn't just come to you in words, but it came to you in words, in the Holy Spirit, in power, and with deep conviction or assurance. That's what the Greek word means there. Deep conviction and assurance. What's Paul talking about here? Paul is basically saying when we preach the gospel to you, it was evidenced or confirmed by God that you are his chosen people by the power of the Holy Spirit that accompanied it. The Greek word there for power is that familiar Greek word dunamis, dunamis. Dunamis means miracle working power. What Paul is saying is when they received the gospel message, he knows that God confirmed it through the miracles that were taking place, the healings of the sick, the casting out of demons, and even possibly the raising of the dead. But we know that God's miracle working power was at work within this church because God had chosen them. And it's true today. There are those churches that are alive in God that see miracles take place on a regular basis. And then you get those other types of churches that are kind of dead, that are I don't want to say more traditional because you can have traditional churches which are alive, if you get what I mean. But they they just go through the motions, okay? And we're not a sort of church, we're not supposed to be the sort of church that just goes through the motions of singing a few hymns, listening to a sermon, and then going home. That's not what church is. Church is the living, breathing body of Christ on earth that's supposed to be filled with the spirit and the dynamis power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should expect miracles in this church on a regular basis, and indeed we see them, don't we? And that's how church should be in this world. It should be a place of God's presence and God's power invading the kingdom of darkness and turning darkness into light. And that's what we're seeing. Amen. I love that. Praise God. It also came with deep conviction and deep assurance. Now, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world in three areas. In regards to sin, in regards to righteousness, and in regards to the judgment to come. And whenever the Apostle Paul preached the gospel, he always included sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. And that is what the gospel really hinges on. If an unbeliever doesn't understand their sin, if an unbeliever doesn't understand God's righteousness, and if an unbeliever doesn't understand that there is a day of judgment coming when they're going to have to give an account to God, then they've not really understood the very foundation of what the gospel message is rooted in and planted upon. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ only makes sense if you understand sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And only when you preach these three things does the conviction of the Holy Spirit come, bringing great assurance that you are born again and saved from the wrath of God. Amen. Amen. So they received the message of Paul, the gospel, in the face of severe suffering. However, they were also filled in the face of severe suffering with supernatural joy. And how many of you know that as born again believers in Jesus Christ, we're all going to face all kinds of tests and trials in our life? You know, that's planned for you. God wants that to happen to you. It's not a very popular message, I know, but at the end of the day, God isn't so interested in whether you're comfortable and cozy in this life. What God is really interested in is that in this life, 
you are transformed into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, so that you can receive eternal life and a place in his eternal kingdom. So if you go through a time of testing and trial in this world so that you're transformed into the image of his son, isn't it better that we suffer a little bit now and inherit the kingdom of God than to have all of the comforts of life now and to miss out on the kingdom of God? And so in the face of severe uh, testing and, and, and trials and, and tribulations and persecutions, God will give you, if you're a true born-again Christian, an inward peace, an inward joy to help you get through the most severe test and trials in your life. He also speaks about how they repented. And repentance isn't much spoken on today in churches. But repentance means a complete turning around, a turning away from your previous way of life. In fact, Jesus said there is no salvation unless you do repent, unless you do change. And Paul is saying that they have repented. They've turned away from these lifeless idols that really aren't gods at all. And they've repented from these and they've turned to the living God of whom they now worship. And because of this, they are now awaiting the return of Jesus Christ from heaven to rescue them from the coming wrath. Now, the Greek word there for wrath is orge. Everyone say orge. Orge, orge means passionate anger. God has a passionate anger against unbelievers. He loves them. He wants to save them, but God isn't up in heaven kind of pleased with wickedness. God is not up in heaven pleased with lying or stealing. God is not pleased with murder or rape. God is not pleased with the war that takes place, the, 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 the terrible crimes that we see on television on a nightly basis that's happening. God isn't up in heaven pleased with this. He has a passionate anger against sin and against those who perpetrate sin. Let's make no mistake about this. God isn't just angry at sin. God is angry at the very people who perpetrate sin in this world. This world is in such a mess because of wicked people. And God is passionately angry against them because of his righteous standard. But on the other hand, because of his love and mercy, he also wants to save them and forgive them. But those people who refuse to repent, those people who refuse to turn from evil, eventually God's wrath, his orge, his passionate anger is going to fall upon them. Let's turn to chapter two. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or from anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because you received the word of God which you heard from us. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus, you suffered from your own countrymen the same things these churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit and the wrath of God has come upon them at last. So Paul now continues in chapter 2. 
And Paul goes on to say that even in the face of severe opposition, Paul continued to share the gospel message. In the face of severe opposition, Paul continued to preach the gospel message. And this is something that every Christian today needs to listen to and needs to hear. Because one of the lies of Satan that I often hear Christians mention to me is that we mustn't shove the gospel down people's throats. In fact, unbelievers will repeat this, won't they? This pat saying, this pat phrase, stop shoving your religion down our throats. And most Christians are like in this politically correct society, oh yes, we mustn't shove the gospel message down people's throats. Let's just kind of keep it to ourselves. If somebody asks me about my faith, then I'll tell them what I believe. Come on. Come on. What did the devil say? He says, stop shoving it down their throat. What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, whether they want it or not, whether they like it or not. Every single creature must receive the gospel message from the mouth of Christians. Of course the devil is going to say, stop shoving it down their throats. Of course unbelievers are going to say, stop shoving it down my throat. Stop being intolerant. Stop being politically incorrect. Of course sinful man is going to want to reject and rebel against and is repelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course. What are you expecting? The apostle Paul said in the face of severe opposition and persecution and testing and trials and suffering, I continued to preach the gospel. Are we going to get any less? Do you think the people in today's society love the gospel any more than they, they loved it poor, or hated the gospel any more than they hated it? Human beings have always been the same. Fallen. Fallen fallen. Don't you dare stop preaching the gospel to every preacher, whether they like it or not. Who is your Lord, Satan or Jesus? Who are you going to obey, Satan or Jesus? Of course Satan doesn't want you to preach the gospel. He doesn't want people saved. He wants people to go to hell. And the surefire way of people going to hell is you not telling them, you not warning them, you not offering the way of eternal life to them. If they reject it, so be it. Their blood is on their own heads. But you have shared the seed. But if you don't scatter any seed, don't expect a crop. Don't complain about the amount of people who are not turning to Jesus Christ. If you are not opening your mouth and sowing seed, sow the seed. Let the Holy Spirit water the seed. Let God cause the seed to grow. Don't ever give up sharing the gospel, even in the face of severe opposition and persecution. Don't you dare follow Paul's example written down in Thessalonians. Amen? Amen. Let's stop making excuses, church. Not just this church, anyone who's watching me right now. Stop making excuses share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody needs to hear it. Now, Paul said that I'm not trying to please man. I'm not trying to please people. I'm trying to please God. And you've, as a Christian, we've got to have this attitude. We're not on this earth to please our husband or our wife. We're not on this earth to please our boss. We're not on this earth to please our friends. We're not on this earth to please our children. We are on this earth to please one person and one person alone. That is to please God. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you sermons that tickle your ears, that make you feel good about yourself, that gives you 10 easy steps to a wonderful life. So you can leave this place and say, isn't Pastor Paul a wonderful preacher? Oh, I really love Pastor Paul. I don't care. (laughs) I only care if Jesus loves me. I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you're living right, you're going to love what I preach. If you're not living right, it's going to be rubbing you up the wrong way. It's going to be a pl- like, like, like sandpaper against the grain. It's going to, it's going to get in you. It's going, to, it's going to stir you. It's going to make you angry. It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to make you say, I don't want to go back to that church. I want to find somewhere else. I want to move on. Oh, God's telling me to go somewhere else. No. 
That's your sin nature. Getting aggravated by my preaching because my preaching is the truth. Because it's the word of God. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I don't care whether you like me or not. The truth is coming from this pulpit. The truth is coming from this lectern. The truth is coming from this church. You better watch out. The truth is coming for you. It's going to get you. You've got to make up your mind what you're going to do with it when it's it grabs up when it bites a hold of you what are you going to do with the truth when it comes for you because it's coming respond to it in the right way by the grace of god amen, amen. paul said i'm not going to use flattery i don't use flattery i don't need to you're such a good looking bunch aren't you hey <laughs> hey take after your pastor don't you hey <laughs> but in all seriousness uh, yeah well um Paul didn't use flattery to try and win people to his side. He didn't put on a mask for greed. He wasn't preaching the gospel to try and get money off of people. In fact, on this occasion, he worked hard so he could provide for himself and for his own missionary team. He wasn't a burden to this particular church. And Paul is motivated to uh, share Christ out of love. It's got to be out of love. It's got to be out of love. Amen? Amen. And uh, Paul sought three things for this church. Number one, to encourage them. Number two, to comfort them. And number three, urging them to live holy lives. And it's the same three things I want for, for this church. I want to comfort you. I want to encourage you. But I also want to urge you to live holy lives. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's not about whether you call yourself a Christian it's not about whether you attend church. It's whether you're holy. It's not about if you're good. Because everyone thinks they're good, right? Even Adolf Hitler, when he was interviewed, he said, yeah, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm doing this for the good of my nation. You know, I'm doing this for the good of the German people. Hitler believed that he was good. He wasn't, though, was he? We all believe we're good deep down, don't we? But we're not. Because if I were to project right now on a massive screen behind me all of your secret thoughts and all of your secret motivations, the reasons why you do what you do or don't do what you do, if I were to project those motivations and those thoughts up on a huge screen, you wouldn't turn up to church, would you? And the thing is, is because God sees the motivations of our hearts even though other people don't. God sees those secret thoughts, even though other people don't see them. And God knows that we're not good. Fundamentally, we're fallen. But praise God for Jesus Christ and his charis grace, because it's through this power, this indwelling power of the Spirit, that we can become the righteousness of God. In fact, in Christ, we are righteous, positionally speaking. But there is power in Jesus to transform you, to change you. You shouldn't be the same person you are today as you were last year. You should be stronger today than you were last year, holier today, more righteous today, closer to God, more knowledgeable of the scriptures today. You should have grown in the last year. And a year from now, you should be able to look back and not even recognize yourself. Say, boy, oh boy, have I grown in the last year in God's grace, in God's power, in God's word. It's about growth, guys. It's about becoming all that we can be in him, through him, and by his power. Amen? Amen. Amen. Paul goes on to say that this church is suffering in the same way that the churches in Judea suffered. And the churches in Judea were taken, they were arrested, they were thrown in jail. Some of them were stoned to death, some of them were beaten horrific we in, in the west we don't experience this if we stub our toe in the morning we think we're being persecuted as christians if it's cold in church it's like oh there's persecution i'm not coming anymore we give up so easily trying to get people to come to a, a tuesday night bible study what go to church twice a week oh, what would we want to do that for it's persecution if you go to India, if you go to China, if you go to Russia, if you go to these places in the Middle East where there's real, those Christians, it's not like, shall I go to church twice a week? Shall I go to Bible study? They are every single morning, every single evening. They are fellowshipping together. They are hiding together underground. They are, they are seeking out one another in caves and in shelters every single day, praying to the Lord, studying whatever little scriptures they have or what they've memorized. 
they are, they are living as Christians. And I think a little bit of real persecution in the West would do us a lot of good. An awful lot of good. So we need to really kind of think, how am I living my Christian life right now? Am I living in a way that Christ is pleased with? Am I really committed, not just to prayer, not just to reading the word, am I committed to his body? Because we are the body of Christ. It's no good saying I love Christ, but you don't love the body. We are the body. If you don't love the body, you don't love Christ. You've got to love the body. And it's fellowship. It's about turning out on cold, dark, wet evenings when it's freezing cold and you know you're going to be cold for an hour or two. Do you love the body enough to suffer? Do you love the body enough to still turn out even when it goes against your comforts? Even when you're missing, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Are you still willing to turn out and to worship? Suan's laughing. She knows she watches it. Don't you, Suan? <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. I love it. But uh, I wouldn't miss church for it. No, not me. I'll be here. Okay. So Paul wanted to come to this church again and again, but uh, he's being blocked by Satan. At the time of this writing, he's only about two weeks away in Corinth. He wants to come back to uh, the Thessalonian church, but because of the political situation, and the danger that Paul would put himself and the church and his missionary team in, Paul is unable to visit them. And so Satan is blocking the way. Paul wants to get to them, but he can't because of the political situation. So Paul tells them that he, he wants to visit them, he loves them, but he just cannot get there at the moment because of the, the political situation that's arisen. And it's estimated, you know, in the Apostle Paul's life, um, on his missionary journeys, remember they didn't have motor cars or motorbikes back then, or trams or buses or planes, he traveled more than 10,000 miles on foot, on boat, on donkey, maybe. 10,000 miles. That is the type of passion that drove this man to make sure that people got the gospel message so they could be saved. Are you the sort of woman are you the sort of man in this place today that would travel 10,000 miles on foot to make sure that people get the gospel message that will save them from the day of judgment? That's the type of commitment that Jesus is looking for in you. Are you a 10,000 mile type of Christian? Paul finishes off the second chapter by saying this. This church is Paul's hope. It's his joy. It's his crown. It's his glory. And Paul is going to glory in this church at the return of Jesus Christ. This church is so precious to Paul. It is everything to him and it grieves him that he can't get to it because of the danger he would put them in. What does this church mean to you? Is it your joy? Is it your glory? Is it your crown? Do you invest into this place, your time, your energy, your labor, your effort? Do you invest your love? Do you invest your heart? Do you invest your mind into Clear Spring Church? Is it your crown? When Christ returns, and he asks you, what did you do? Will you turn around to him and say, I loved Clear Spring Church with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, with all of my body. I loved your body, Lord Jesus. I loved the people in that church. They are my crown. I challenge you this morning to go higher in him, to go deeper in him, to become all that you are supposed to be in him. And he will give you grace upon grace to achieve the very thing he has called you to. God bless you. Thank you for listening.